Hi, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread. I'm coming to you from the Hans Auditorium in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we've held the last four bread symposiums. And as you can see, there's nobody here but me. And this is where we usually have it. The seats are all empty because this year, thanks to you, the symposium will be presented online virtually in our new presentation hall, which is where I will join you in just a minute. Thank you, and thanks for being part of our new virtual Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puratos. Welcome again. Throughout the entire symposium, I'll be thanking our generous sponsors over and over again, and ask that you do as well by visiting their booths and pavilions in the Exhibitor Hall. There you will see lots of bonus content and you can also make appointments to meet with the folks from these companies that serve our baking community so well. Our presenting sponsor is Puratos, who has partnered with us from the very beginning for all of our symposiums. And it is their support that helped us get this one of a kind gathering of thought leaders off the ground. Please also visit our fabulous flour and milling sponsors, Ardent Mills. Lindley Mills, and Central Milling. Thank you also to our equipment sponsors, the WP Bakery Group, an allied bakery and food service equipment. And thank you also to our specialty food product companies, ProBioTeam, Fire Within, Big Green Egg, and Mock Mill. Please check out all of their booths to learn about their wonderful and unique products. And also thanks to our media sponsors, Cook's Country, The Local Palette, The James Beard Foundation, and The Bread Baker's Guild of America. You'll be hearing more about all of them throughout the entire series of presentations. So again, thank you to all our sponsors. At the end of today's presentation, you will also see our credit scroll thanking all of the people behind the scenes who made this event possible, including our production and technical partner, Ganoid Communications, our creative team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University, our hosts for this, our fourth annual gathering. So stick around if you will. But now it's time to get things rolling with today's presentation. So let's go live and once again, Welcome to the Johnson & Wales International Symposium on Bread, presented by Puratos. And hello, we're live again. Welcome to a new Monday. And uh, I'm Peter Reinhardt, and we have with us today, Jonathan Deutsch and Rebecca Etter, who are going to be taking the stage in just a second. Uh, a couple quick announcements before we do. A reminder that um, this Wednesday, we'll have um, Richard Coppage will be joining us and he'll be doing a, a presentation that he calls uh, New Techniques for a New Time. That's gluten-free baking, new technique for a new time. So it's going to be a gluten-free baking demonstration. Uh, Richard Coppage, as many of you know, is the uh, baking instructor, bread instructor at the Culinary Institute of America in New York City in uh, Hyde Park and also the author of the of Gluten-Free Baking by the Culinary Institute. So he's the author of that book. This is kind of a pet area for him is gluten-free and he's developed his own techniques that are um, that have been uh, borrowed by other people, but uh, that are distinctly his and uh, he's been adding to them. So we're gonna see what, what new stuff he has for us then. And then next Monday, uh, Josh Allen of Companion Baking in St. Louis uh, is He's going to, his presentation is kind of a follow-up of today's. Uh, we're going to be talking next week. His topic is called uh, Trash Talk. <laughs> and it's basically how to affect the bottom line by, uh, by directly uh, addressing issues of waste and trash. So in today, I think uh, Jonathan and, and Rebecca are going to talk a little bit about another way of dealing with the sort of affecting the bottom line by repurposing um, unsold bread. So I'm going to just turn it over to you guys, uh, uh, Jonathan and uh, Rebecca. You guys are coming to us from where? You're—I know you're in Philly, Jonathan, right? You're at Drexel. 
We're both in the Philly area. Philly area. And uh, Rebecca, we're going to find out a little bit more uh, when we come back from the presentation, talk a little bit more about some of the new things that you're into these days. But Great. Um, in the meantime, why don't we just, I'm just going to turn around and let you guys have it. The rest of you, uh, if you have questions, use the Q&A button uh, and I'll gather them and we'll, we'll deal with them at the end of this formal presentation. Uh, I think this presentation is going to go for about 20, 25 minutes or so, and then we'll get into uh, back and forth with Q&A. So uh, Jonathan, you're, you're on. All right, sounds great. And I think, uh, well, I'll introduce myself and then uh, turn it over to Rebecca. I'm John Deutsch. Um, it's uh, really an honor to be presenting uh, and, and sharing the stage this week with Chef Coppage. It's like a, a great thrill. I was a, a student at CIA um, when he was relatively new. Uh, and, and Peter, um, just what a, what a phenomenal program. Thank you so much for having us. And, and um, a, a true honor also to, to share the stage with my uh, collaborator, advisory board member, friend, Rebecca Etter, who's um, the, I, I, I'm gonna declare her the, the leading mind in uh, food innovation. And we've had uh, a great partnership over the years. And, and part of that you'll hear about um, shortly. Um, so I um, am a professor of culinary arts and science and a certified research chef. I teach uh, classes like uh, introductory culinary, but also uh, food product development and gastronomy here at Drexel uh, and um, direct the Drexel Food Lab, which you'll hear about in a, in a few slides from now. And I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Great. Um, well, thanks for saying that, John. I truly uh value our partnership and friendship throughout the years. And I think it's certainly the foundation of what we're gonna to share today. Um, and um, thanks for saying those kind words, but everybody, hi, it's, it's wonderful to be here today. My name is Rebecca Etter. Thank you, Peter, and the whole Johnson and Wales University team for having John and I uh, discuss what we're going to share today. Um, I, uh, Peter kind of alluded to, um, you know, some, some changes within kind of what my day to day looks like, but this work here, um, this partnership is one that John and I worked on when I was uh, at Grupo Bimbo and Bimbo Bakeries USA. Um, should be noted that I, I've since moved on, but Alicia Rosas, who is the VP of Innovation for BBU, um, so that's Bimbo Bakeries USA, would love to chat. Uh, with any anybody interested uh, in doing so after this. So I uh, have included her her name there and her, her email, jot it down. Uh, I can put it in the chat too later. But um, without further ado, I guess we can move forward. I'll, I'll share a little bit about my previous organization and um, certainly the, the partnership we had. Um, so for those of you who um, may be uh, semi-familiar or not at all about who Grupo Bimbo is, um, it is, uh, Grupo Bimbo is a company of 75 years old, uh, family-run company uh, and global leader within the baking industry, um, not just in kind of traditional bakery categories, but also uh, an important player in adjacent categories, snack categories. Um, very big footprint. Um, really, really striving to um, provide access and to, to feed everybody and um, uh, doing so with uh, over 133,000 associates, um, over 2.8 million points of sale, uh, and a, a lot of bakeries throughout uh, the U.S. and throughout um, our global footprint. Uh, where, um, where we operate or where they operate, um, they distribute fresh, fresh and fro frozen, excuse me, sliced bread, buns, cookies, snack cakes, English muffins, bagels, packaged foods, tortillas, salty snacks, and et cetera. So um, uh, definitely in a lot of categories. If we move forward, um, these are some of the brands that um, you may recognize from, um, you know, your grocery store um, or, you um, convenience store or otherwise. Uh, big ones in the U.S. being Entenmann's, Thomas, uh, Sara Lee, uh, and then the Arnold or Wheat Brownberry, depending on where you are in the U.S. And yes, I'm also in the Philadelphia area, as mentioned before. Um, if we uh, move forward, we can see um, that I'm sharing a bit of behind the curtain about what the Grupo Bimbo philosophy is. So really the purpose of the company is to be um, a sustainable, highly productive, and deeply humane company uh, with a mission to get delicious uh, and nutritious baked goods and snacks in the hands of all. So that 
you know, really is reflected in, in our presence and footprint there. Um, and vision is to, uh, this says 2020, which of course we've since moved on, but um, is still relevant in the sense of um, Grupo Bimbo strives uh, to continue to transform the baking industry um, through their uh, global leadership, um, you know, really seeking to understand how to better serve more consumers. Um, and within that, if we move forward, um, it's really, um, you know, within the, the past 70 years, especially has been, um, you know, company, as I've mentioned, is 75 years old, um, deeply uh, part of what we, uh, what the company would call being sustainable and highly productive, deeply humane is having um, a um, clear purpose in sustainability. Um, so, um, mainly from a manufacturing side for a good deal of, of the early years in terms of reduction in efficiencies, um, but really understanding the impact that the company has within the communities that they serve, um, as well as um, just overall reduction in, in uh, how we kind of bring uh, products to market. Um, this has all um, kind of, if we move to the next slide, um, continue to build into not just uh, manufacturing goals, but things that then we can uh, design within our overall approach that then leads um, to commitments that um, expand how the company continues to be a force for good um, through actions and as well as, again, this ability to nourish a better world without leaving a, an impact or trace. Um, that really did lead us on the next slide to come to Drexel um, for a number of different projects um, in that um, product development course that John mentioned earlier um, to explore a, a multi-year partnership solving key business problems that we um, were looking to address through product ideation, through development, um, and, and general recipe development. Um, going to Drexel, if um, I believe there might be a build here because of, of course, um, you know, the ability to uh, partner together within sustainability. Um, you know, John certainly is, um, you know, a, a top mind um, within the upcycled and food waste space. So within this particular project, that was a key reason why um, John and the students at the lab um, were great partners in, in the work that we wanted to do. Um, this being kind of one of our more uh, consumer facing or externally facing product related initiatives as it relates to food waste. So if we move to the next slide and share a little bit more um, about the food lab, which John, I'm happy to do in, in a parallel uh, tag team with you if you'd like. Um, but really um, the reason why we went to the, to the food lab uh, is because um, you know, they, it's a food product design and culinary innovation lab um, that applies science to improve health, um, to improve the health of people, um, the, the planet and also economies. Um, if you wanna, if, um, do you wanna take this slide or I'm happy to, uh, do you wanna add anything more? Absolutely, yeah, I can, I can jump in. And just as a, as a point of interest, uh, these are two uh, alumni of the Food Lab in this slide. And some of you may recognize Alex De Los Reyes, who uh, was most recently at Piratas. And uh, that's ultimately why we do this. So we always say we have two types of products. The food products um, are obviously important, but our real product is our future colleagues uh, and collaborators out, out in the world. So we're really, really proud of those students. So. Yeah, so all of our work is um, student driven, uh, faculty mentored, uh, and we do this through uh, a lot of consumer research, uh, food product development and commercialization. Um, and as I mentioned, we're um, developing two, two products, the food and our future colleagues who are learning how to improve the food system as they do this work. Um, I, I would say from my own culinary education, which was admittedly a very long time ago, decades ago, um, there was learning how to cook and learning how to bake. And then there was this little corner of the, of the culinary school that was like, oh, if you're a kind of a green farm to table sustainability type person, you might be interested in you know, gardening or you might be interested in a field trip or you might be interested in reading more, going to a lecture. 
but sustainability wasn't really integrated into the education. And um, that's a, a change that we're um, very committed to with this work. With regards to the, um, you know, one of the um, reasons why we uh, at Bimbo wanted to go with to John and his team at the at the lab um, for so many different partnerships and so many different questions is is that you know in in environment in in study uh, application of solving the problem. I think that. Um, there, we, we're not able to talk to a lot of the specific solutions within the food waste pipeline, um, but there, ha there were a number of um, reflections of we've been trying to address this problem for a number of years and didn't think about the question in that way. Um, so just echoing the, the value of having um, these minds, these, uh, you know, these wonderful students as part of the process. Um, the, the brief that we brought to John and the team at the Drexel Food Lab was really help us um, define, you know, help us figure out a different solution for these return products that are being thrown away and put into landfills. Um, we really only focused on return bread products, so products that were packaged or finished goods within the scope um, from our, you know, which were returned to the BBU sale centers or bakeries. Um, and we really wanted the uh, team to help us think about beyond crumbs or stuffing or croutons, which might be um, you know, certainly a good solution, but one that you might be used to seeing. Um, so um, looking at new business models are were certainly within scope um, and we weren't um, limiting ourselves to just uh, products within the baking industry. Um, I think the next slide here will then talk a little bit more about our process together um, and more information on on just the the products coming up, and then we can continue to touch on that afterwards. Great. So I am going to switch to a um, short video that um, summarizes our product probably better than we could ourselves. Just bear with me one second while I get that up. Food waste is a serious problem. Just 40% of food in the U.S. ends up in the trash. That's everything from you tossing out milk that's gone bad to commercial food producers trucking out tons of scraps. That second piece is really where there's a big opportunity for change. And the Food Lab at Drexel University is helping make it happen. Ours is a very practical challenge. It's what do we do with all this, right? Food producers come to the Drexel Food Lab with a food waste problem, and students will develop commercially viable products, what they call upcycled food. The project we're doing right now is for Bimbo Bakeries USA, which is the largest bakery in the country. They have about $635 million of bread and other baked goods that are returned to the factory because they've reached their sell-by date. We get returns from our different customer teams, whether it be grocery stores, convenience stores, or otherwise. And we wanted to find a means for reuse for our products. The very first thing we do, we observe people in their natural habitat, figure out how they're interacting with bread, how they're using bread. The next thing we do is some consumer insights. We bring consumers into the classroom and do a focus group. Those develop into themes around which we generate new ideas. We prototype, we recheck them with consumers, and by the end of this really rapid 10 weeks, we will have solutions for the company to consider. It's important for Beanbow Bakeries USA to have a dialogue and to help solve the food waste problem. We're a big company, we have an opportunity to provide a great amount of impact. Waste is a social construct, so what you do with food determines whether it's food or waste, right? We want to reframe waste to think of it as not recycling food waste, but preventing food waste. We have a long history at Drexel of providing a lot of those ideas through our students. I'm working on an avocado pit tea. Turns out avocado pits are really high in antioxidants and I was like whoa we're just throwing these away like we can create something out of this there's nothing wrong with it it's perfectly fine we're just not used to using it that doesn't mean that we can't do other things with them the World Bank estimates that by 2050 we're going to have to increase food production by 50 percent 
to keep up with the growing population. If you're a farmer, if you're a baker, whatever you're doing, no one can scale 50%. But then if you factor in that 33 to 40% that we're wasting and chip away at that 50% that we need, then you start to see, okay, maybe this isn't so bad. We're getting a lot of requests from food producers who want to green their habits or make healthier food, but they need help doing that. They need ideas, they need energy, they need talent, and we can work with them to provide that. back here. I know it would have taken my students a tenth of the time it's taken me to do this. You're doing great. <laughs> so um, as Rebecca said, you know, we um, students- Join Target Circle to get perks about the annual fee. Score savings and deals in store and online. Plus help Target support your- um, as Rebecca was saying, um, we can't share everything uh, because a lot of it is proprietary to the company, uh, but the students came up with over 50 ideas um, together and they range from kind of small, somewhat silly, but cool ideas too. Um, one I can share is um, they um, identified a problem, which is that um, plastic Frisbees are very bad for dogs and uh, can dogs tend to chew them and it does, can do damage to their teeth and their gums and if they swallow it to their um, digestive tract. And so one of, the, one of my favorite uh, totally not feasible ideas, but a lot of fun to think about was a um, leftover bread waste or returns um, compressed into dog Frisbees and kind of with an edible coating. Uh, they actually threw really well. So uh, I, I don't mind the virtual at all, but I, I did wish I could have uh, have you all in that beautiful auditorium that was that Peter was showing and, and throw you some bread frisbees from the stage. Um, so that was really cool. Um, and but but I would say what what we would say in, in product development, a, a small idea, um, up to really big ideas, thinking about where where we're using wheat that's taking up farmland and could be used for other things, and where bread might fulfill that function. So things like soy sauce or um, my my favorite that I just think someone's got to market this would be a rye rye of you know rye rye brewed rye whiskey brewed from rye bread, um, you know building on the toast ale stuff. So there there are a lot of great ideas, um, and you know as as often happens in this world, you know we think okay well, that was fun maybe something will come of it, and then there's sort of silence for a while and then next thing you know someone reaches out and says oh we had a question about that work you did a couple of years ago so that's that's always really exciting to to hear um so what i want to do is put this in a little bit of context about the larger um upcycling world and um taking leftovers or food that would otherwise be wasted and turning it into value-added products um i wear another hat in addition to my um professor uh, of culinary arts and science hat, which is um, president of the Upcycled Food Foundation, which is the um, 501c3 nonprofit sister organization of the 501c6 uh, trade association called the Upcycled Food Association. Um, and so when we were doing this work uh, together uh, with Rebecca, with Sheetal, who you saw who had the avocado pit uh, tea and after some her marketing head, she no longer calls them avocado pits, but avocado seeds sounds much more appealing to the consumer. Um, this organization didn't exist. Uh, the, the work we did was around the spring of um, 18 through 19. Uh, and this organization started in November of 19. Um, with nine founding members, including Reveal Avocado Seed Brew and us. Uh, all startups, all kind of small uh, upstarts. Um, 
in, in this world and now has over 170 members, including uh, not so startups like Dole and Mondelez. And it was great watching that video because actually one of the people, one of the students in the video is now at Mondelez and, and uh, another is, is doing this kind of work full time. So it's really exciting to see. Um, and within the Upcycled Food Association, there are many ingredients. I know um, those of you who are regulars at this um, symposium heard from uh, Dan Kurtzrock from Regrained, uh, but there's a number of products. I just selected a few that we work with. There are probably more that I'm gonna uh, get a, a nudge in my email about. Um, but Renewal Mill, for example, um, uses um, Okara, which is the pulp from uh, soy milk and tofu production. Uh, Net Zero is doing brewer spent grain, distiller spent grain, also um, calcium from eggshells, um, which has some really interesting um, baking potential. Uh, Regrained is, is brewer spent grain. Uh, Nutriberry are um, seeds from um, things like raspberry seeds and other um, fruit powders that are, are also really interesting from a baking perspective. Uh, AgriCycle has a huge range of, of products, um, mostly alternative flowers um, from fruits and vegetables. Um, they're, um, they start these drying micro enterprises throughout the world uh, and, and buy at, at a fair trade rate um, various, various flowers. So things that are really not on the market like uh, jack seed, uh, jackfruit seed flour with a rise in um, jackfruit for um, alternative um, proteins, uh, meat analog kind of pulled pork texture. Um, there was an opportunity to do something with all those seeds um, through things like cassava flour that you can get from conventional um, suppliers, but this is a, a different model. Uh, and I wanna show you a case uh, in the next slide that uses this uh, planetarians, which is, um, a flower made from uh, defatted um, sunflower pomace. Uh, so it's the what's left in the press after they make sunflower seed oil, uh, very high protein, uh, flavorful um, and fibrous um, pulp that is, that is then um, made into a flower. Um, one of the things we always emphasize with our students with, when working with these products is to, I, I just, uh, broke my own rule and, and I'm calling these flowers, uh, but we really have to call them powders uh, because bakers get frustrated that they, they don't act and um, behave like flour. Um, they, they behave like novel food powders, which they are. Uh, and it doesn't mean they're, they're good or bad. It just means you have to know how to use them. So we get a lot of frustrated calls from uh, folks who are trying to work with spent grain or um, uh, planetarians flour or whatever, and they say, well, you know, I, I took out half of my bread flour and replaced it. And, you know, it's sort of like, oh, well, there's your problem. Uh, it doesn't work like flour. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time on that kind of work. Um, so as I mentioned, I can't tell you everything uh, that we did for um, for Bimbo uh, in terms of solutions, but um, I can tell you about a product we did on our own um, that is in commercialization. Um, and so I, I thought that would be interesting and I have permission um, from uh, our N of one, uh, Fiona, to tell this story about a big upcycled big product that we, um, we made featuring that planetarian's flower. Um, so Fiona's mom came to us and asked for um, help solving a very particular problem. Um, this is a, essentially a customized nutrition project, uh, which is all the rage right now. Um, you, can, you can sort of send your, send your uh, stats and your blood sample and they can come back and tell you what you should be eating. And we were in some ways, you know, very ahead of the curve with this project. So um, Fiona is, um, on the autism spectrum, uh, like many um, children with autism, she has um, what what most people would call picky. She's a picky eater, uh, but in the literature, it's called selective eating. 
Um, so she eats as, as you would uh, imagine very selectively. And so this is her, um, it's not a great picture, I apologize. This is from her teacher and this is her lunchbox. And you'll see that uh, it's a little bit unique in that it's, it's almost like a bento box with separate components. And that's very important to Fiona because um, she doesn't like things touching in her. Uh, and, and when things touch, she tends to reject them. Um, and this is her lunchbox, which is made up of her favorite foods, plus some foods that are pushing the envelope in it to encourage her to be a little less selective. So her favorite foods are on um, these veggie straws, um, which are not super veggie, um, but they're called that. Uh, and they have some vegetable powders, apples, carrots, and celery. And you see these are touching. That was a new experiment and that one was successful. And in the middle here are blueberries. Um, that was to try to encourage her to eat something new and that was unsuccessful. And where her hand is, is our product. So her teacher wanted us to show uh, that we were successful in, in enticing her. Um, but if you exclude our product, you have carrots, celery, apples, and veggie straws, all of which she loves and eats enthusiastically. Um, none of which have any protein to speak of. Um, and so um, Fiona was really struggling to maintain um, adequate weight, um, would not accept anything like a Pediasure, and uh, it was really a battle um, at home and, um, and caused a lot of, a lot of tension and, and angst. Um, one thing the parents noticed, um, however, was that Fiona, um, in addition to the crunchy things on her tray, would also like to eat from the dog bowl. Um, and obviously that's not kind of behavior that, that you wanna encourage in a child. Um, and they consulted with the nutritionist and the nutritionist said, well, it's probably not going to kill her, but let's try to get her on some human food. And the nutritionist made some suggestions of, you know, other types of foods that, that might work. But really, none of those suggestions met the goal in terms of protein. So if you think about it, any, any protein-rich food like cheese, beans, meat, fish, tofu, um, it all, peanut butter, it all has that mushy texture that, that she rejects. Um, so um, using that, um, that defatted sunflower seed powder, um, as well as um, bread from upcycled bread, leftover bread returns, um, we were able to develop a high protein cracker um, that kind of um, satisfied the, that kind of crunchy texture that she loved. Um, and as it turns out, um, this is a very common um, problem. So selective eating is one of the most commonly um, um, experienced, um, you know, behaviors with, with autism. Uh, it's idiosyncratic. So, you know, sometimes it's um, people prefer beige and tan food and don't like food with bright colors. Other times um, they don't like um, kind of slimy, mushy things like um, like puddings or um, or panna cotta or that kind of texture. Uh, I definitely fall into that category. Um, but the um, the the affinity for like crunchy sort of goldfish crackers, if goldfish crackers were uh, a good source of protein. Uh, was kind of the sweet spot. So um, we developed this, this product and I will show you a little uh, video. Oh, I will try to show you a little video. Maybe I can't, I think I may have lost it. I'll, I'll try to show you later. Um, but suffice it to say, she's very enthusiastic about this, uh, about this upcycled food product. So that got us down this road of, of using um, these ingredients to really celebrate the, the features they have um, rather than looking at them as a problem. You know, what do you do with leftover bread? What do you do with um, okara from tofu production? Saying, 
um, really adding it to our toolkit as product developers and as chefs to say, if you need protein, um, yes, you can add, you know, um, whey protein, or you could add, you know, soy protein isolate, but you could also use something like an okara or a spent grain flour, and that's opened up a lot of new areas for us. Um, I think what I'd like to do is pause. Um, I have some research we can share, um, but we're about halfway through the hour and I just want to um, get a sense of whether there are any questions or discussion. Um, so we're Looks not like just... we do have a question. Um, do you have a company that adopted the cracker idea? We are looking for a partner on that. So if uh, anyone wants to talk offline, we'd be happy to. We have, um, right now we have food service and, um, and home, uh, we're giving the recipe to parents, um, but we have not done like a, a packaged product, a CPG type product. Any other questions? Uh, I was asking, how were those crackers? They looked really good in the picture. Oh, they're, they're I delicious. Think they're, um, most importantly, Fiona thinks they're delicious. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it seems like to me, like crackers just jumped off the screen at me as like uh, an, an obvious idea. I mean, it's a, what a great uh, upcycling of breadcrumbs and other ingredients to create something that everybody loves, which is crackers. Uh, right. I'm amazing right. that, that, that a, a large company hasn't uh, hasn't grabbed that one and run with it. That yeah, that's a great point, Peter. Uh, you know, and and maybe Rebecca, I know Rebecca kind of understands this world uh, better than I do. My my sense is there's a lot of fear about getting into new areas, and you know we see that with upcycling too. I I, I say it's it's sort of a it's like a wild west standoff where everyone's hand is on their revolver, but no one's waiting to draw until, you know, whether, you know, someone comes out with this breakfast cereal, upcycled breakfast cereal, or, uh, you know, upcycled snack cake or something. And then I think everyone's going to jump in, but they're all, they're all kind of circling now and watching. You're right. Nobody yeah. wants first. They, you go first and if it works, then I'll jump in too. I think what it comes down to, I mean, certainly if you talk about the powders, John, that you highlighted and other people you can partner with from an ingredient perspective um, outside of your, like your infrastructure at, a, at some of these bigger companies. I mean, you certainly, there are a variety of ways to be successful and get it, get, get it done. Um, but I think a, there is a lot of opportunity for people, these companies, not just Bimbo, um, but companies to reimagine what their returns look like. And when you talk about that type of problem to solve, you do get into um, a food safety and quality kind of edit or audit, I should say, of what, you're, what you can do within the manufacturing um, process that you have. So I think that there's um, a lot of, of people who really want, um, you know, all, all throughout the organization and all levels who want um, to be doing these types of products um, and with the industry kind of being broader, you know, as more established broadly, um, it could be easier to partner in, in these types of powders or otherwise and bringing into um, and then kind of make a case for reimagining what one's returns and otherwise look like. But it, um, it does seem like a little bit of, a, you know, the Wild West in the sense of everybody wants to be in that, that shootout. Um, but maybe looking at the tumbleweed a little bit in the in the between time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. And and the other the other metaphor is it's a little chicken or egg, right? Because you know, large companies will say, well, there's no supply chain for doing this at scale, mm -hmm. and the ingredient companies are saying, well, you know, for example, as long as we're drinking beer, there's way more spent grain than we'll ever ever be able to, you know absorb in the you know in the supply chain so you just need to tell us you're ready and and so i i think we're getting to to a point um that we're 
we're going to see more people working vertically and getting the partners at the table because I, I think it, it has to happen that way. And I do think that there is a receptivity to partnering to find real um, long term solutions within this space. Um, yeah. And that, like you just said, will be a key unlock um, of making this really have the type of impact that everybody's hoping to have. Yeah, I saw a comment, uh, Runner 12, about uh, cookies. Yes, who doesn't love cookies? I think the the crackers um, were a lot more palatable. It's interesting because we all know crackers have sugar, cookies have sugar, sugars are carb carbohydrates and so on. Uh, but the low in added sugar was really important for the nutritionists we were talking to, uh, for the dietitians. They were very concerned uh, about keeping the added sugar to, to a minimum. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we went the savory route. Um, and also because it, um, it's protein that was kind of absent. So something cheesy, you know, a cheesy cracker or savory thing was a little bit easier. Um, I do have those videos so we can. Um, oh, good. Uh, oh, and that, this is a question. Maybe Rebecca can do the next one, but I'll, I'll show you the video first. Yeah, how are the returns monitored for freshness before incorporating them into another item? Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's you know, a bit of what I was referring to in terms of having these right uh, safety protocols and, and quality protocols in place. Um, and can really share with you that there isn't a universal solution yet for that. And I think you know, that's probably people's, uh, some organizations' trepidations about then incorporating them into um, products. Um, but what I can say and that I can't speak to because it wasn't um, my function at the organization, but there are um, certainly individuals who evaluate the returns from a quality perspective um, that then, you know, um, get either filtered into maybe a thrift store environment uh, or then decide that it should just be returned, um, sent to a landfill. Um, I can't speak to that, but um, maybe um, Alicia, as a follow-up in the organization, might be able to help with that. Um, the, there's an anonymous question. Uh, isn't a large amount of spent grain um, the, the question is, is there a large amount of spent grain that goes to livestock feed? Um, can I at least share, uh, and John, I think you could probably also follow up uh, on this and build more, but um, from a returns perspective and what was then given to livestock versus landfill, um, I do think that the organization kind of hit a certain threshold that they were at capacity with sending to livestock. So while it is a good solution, um, it isn't uh, a long-term one uh, in the sense that a lot of uh, those farmers kind of have, have what they need um, and the impact needs to kind of be minimized uh, even still. Yeah, and from, from what I've been hearing, um, it's very situational. So um, if a brewery is near a farm and they can do a deal with the farmer to pick up that spent grain, it works pretty well. Um, but the spent grain is very unstable. Um, it's still fermenting. Uh, it can grow mold. It needs cold chain. Uh, even for animal feed, um, and the the hauling is a big cost. So um, one of the challenges with with things like okara and spent grain is that the commodity is pretty reasonably priced. And so you know if you if you want to feed um, an animal grain, you know obviously it's expensive, but it's relatively low cost compared to um, stabilizing that grain, maybe drying it, um, you know, ship it, hauling it, and so on. So, in in some ways, it takes it could even raise the cost or, or require extra commitment to sustainability versus just calling the the feed supplier and and putting it in an order. Um, I don't see questions now, but keep them coming. I'm gonna show you those videos that didn't work before and we can get into a little bit of the research if you're interested. Um, so this is the um, 
Fiona picking up her um, crackers from the post office. And I always tell my students if they can have all of their guests uh, eat their food with as much enthusiasm, we'll be in good shape. Oh. <laughs> It's getting so close. Oh, open, please. Are you excited? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Say thank you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so There's her. Num. Crunchy? Mm, crunchy. Say thank you, friend. I love these. Mm, so, so you get the idea, but it's it's super gratifying uh, for the students to see that their little work in the lab, you know, translates to this and, and really to to um, health. I mean, they're they're this obviated, this little kind of I don't want to say stupid, but this simple solution um, was able to to um, prevent the tube feeding that they were the dietitian was threatening. Um, so just real uh, kind of briefly, um, we'll close if you have more questions. Uh, they were great, uh, but we've also been doing quite a lot of research into consumer attitudes around upcycling. So uh, we talked about supply chain and, and those kinds of challenges, but um, what about the demand side? What about the consumer side? Um, so one of the first studies we did was even before uh, upcycled was in, in broad usage. Um, it was certainly used, but um, it was used alongside things like rescued and salvaged and other terms. Um, we did a study with consumers where we developed a very deliberately dry, boring uh, term for upcycled foods and we call them VASP, value added surplus products. And we ask consumers, what would you call these value added surplus products? And upcycled was the big winner. Um, everyone liked upcycled and that um, was influential in kind of defining the field as we've defined it. Um, and the other thing that was in the same study was we asked people, well, when you think of upcycled food, do you think of it like organic food? Do you think of it like regular food? Do you think of it as just like a feature like non-GMO or, or other things that you might see on a label? And they really saw it as its own separate category, um, but they saw it um, closer to organic than conventional in a lot of ways um, as some sort of natural, better for the planet, um, better option, which is really exciting. Um, I'm going to skip that one. Um, so that's the kind of encouraging news. Um, less encouraging, maybe, depending on your perspective. We asked consumers, uh, had they heard of upcycled food or had they tried upcycled food? Most of them have not. Um, so from, uh, you know, we, we live and breathe this stuff and I'm always, I'm always, uh, catching myself, you know, saying upcycled food and, and someone says, uh, what is that exactly? Um, so it's, it's definitely a growing category. Um, and we um, did a study uh, to define it. And that definition is that it uses ingredients that would otherwise not have gone to human consumption, which would include like the bread returns that we talked about, are procured and produced using verifiable supply chains and have a positive impact on the environment. Yeah, that's a great question, um, Runner, about food allergies. Um, so the question is, I applaud your efforts in trying to find a place for food waste. I see a need for people with food allergies. Have you also considered this group? So one of the challenges with um, returns in particular, it's a little bit easier with things like um, spent grain that you're using as an ingredient. Um, but when we repurpose food, we always call it hyperallergenic. Um, because you, we, we just don't know, right? Where, you know, um, if you're making, um, if you're a gluten-free bakery, for example, and you say we're not certified, it's possible that it was made in a facility with gluten, that kind of thing. You can know that going in. Um, when you're working with returns, um, 
you know, what if that case was opened in a restaurant and then it's donated, um, even if it's not being uh, repurposed or reprocessed, uh, it, it's definitely a challenge. Um, and I, I think the last the last thing I'll, I'll um, show on this, and then we can get back to discussion, is um, one of the big questions that industry has are is around will people pay more for upcycled foods or will people even pay? And when I started this work, there were there were two big concerns from the food industry about upcycling. Um, one was that if consumers found out, uh, they were concerned that if consumers found out that, that they were eating food that was would otherwise be wasted, um, they might reject it. It might cause a scandal. I don't know if you remember the pink slime scandal a few years ago, which was just you know basically getting scraps of meat. <laughs> off the bones of very sustainable practice, but it didn't look very appetizing coming out of the machine and it, it created a scandal. Uh, and the other one was that if they did know that, they might accept it, but they would want a discount. And we've, we found that without any intervention, if we just say, here's a chicken nugget, here's an upcycled chicken nugget, it probably won't surprise you to know that people don't wanna pay as much for the upcycled version as for the original. Um, what we did find, though, was, was with a little bit of uh, messaging, and we're not talking about an, a webinar, we're talking about a, a line on the package that says upcycled food uses food that would otherwise be wasted or upcycled food is, has environmental benefit. Um, they will pay more. Um, so the striped line is the, the baseline. Interestingly, the orange line is uh, some messaging we use that we called emotional messaging. So uh, when someone think of the children, they're, you know, we need to, um, we need to be better actors and, and there's people starving and we're throwing away all this food. Um, the green was rational messaging, um, meaning um, this is good for the environment. Um, Food and organic matter is a huge uh, component of landfill. And by doing this, you reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, very straightforward, rational, and we found that they will pay more, although it varies a little bit by category. Um, so I think we can unshare. I saw a question from Jean, thank you. Yes, uh, hyperallergenic uh, seems to work for that. So we're coming up on the end of the hour. Any other questions or from here? Would you mind going back to that final summary page? Uh, because I didn't get a chance to read uh, all of the sort of uh, yeah. outcomes. Yeah, that was just from this one study. So I will do that now. So this is just from that, that last study about the willingness to pay. Mm. I see. Uh, Okay, thanks. Um, so that was just one of the issues. The and then uh, uh, the other question that I had, and let's see if uh, anyone else wants to jump in with a few before we run out of time, is um, are there are there any? Well, first of all, going back to the frisbee, is is did anyone ever do anything with that? Are there frisbees out there, red frisbees that people can use? Uh, they're not. Um, I will say that was one of my favorite concepts as well. Um, we can't speak to the specific uh, concepts that are under development within the organization. I certainly um, am no longer there, so I don't know what the most latest and greatest is. But uh, unfortunately, no dog for us to be out there. But if anybody wants to take that to market, I'll, I'll be the first to buy it. I don't even have a dog, but I think it's great. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a, a, a fun product. and. It almost could be like, uh, uh, can dogs eat wheat and can they eat bread without any kind of adverse effects? So if, if so, it's almost like a dog bone. Exactly. It could be after they catch it, they can chomp on it and eat it, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert in, uh, in dog nutrition. I, I think like a lot of things, it's probably fine in moderation, but it shouldn't be a, a big component of no. it. No, they can't be eating frisbees all day. But 
we no, about the that's, that, that, that's a good example, as you were talking about, as uh, you know, sort of examples of what could happen. That that a little creativity, thinking out of the box, can really lead to a lot of innovation. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Let me see. Uh, I pulled out that we already talked about Jean's uh, comment. Um, I mean, I will say, um, as as you're, you know, just to build on that, one of the students that participated in the product development course when we were addressing this food waste problem to solve was um, in industrial design. You know, was a product, you know, different kind of of designer than would be typical in that process, um, and I can just speak to. Um, the importance of solving these problems, having diverse views in the room. Um, you know, we were, you know, focusing a lot on the outcome of the Frisbee. Um, but like you said, that that brings creativity uh, if you have these diverse views. So um, just want to kind of circle back and, and hit that on that again. What about the starch components of, of you know, leftover bread? Can it be, can it be turned into some kind of a functional, you know, starch product uh, thickeners and things like that. Has, has, was there any, has there been any work in that area? John, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, there, there has been as far as I know, um, but, and this kind of actually relates to the question that just came in the chat from El Canela. Um, the starch is pretty affordable. Mm. Right. So um, it depends on the, what I would say. Uh, and the question is, do upcycled foods tend to cost more to produce? It depends on the commodity. Right. So um, soybeans are one of the cheapest food sources. So stabilizing Okara and using it as a soy protein typically costs more than just getting soy protein. Right. Or soybeans. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, um, there's a um, product we work with called Matriarch uh, Broth, which is a vegetable broth that's made from fresh cut produce scraps. So collecting things like um, onion peels and carrot peels and cooking them into a broth, you know, chefs have been doing this forever, um, but the food industry hasn't. Um, and so... Um, you know, there it makes perfect sense and, and they're basically, you know, paying nothing for, um, or, or, you know, pennies on the dollar um, for these scraps and then able to, are able to produce food products. So I think it's just situational. Avocado seeds are a great example too, where they really had no value. Uh, it was just a cost to dispose of them. And as anyone who does, a, has a home compost bin knows, they, they don't, compost well. Uh, they just turn into rocks that, that last for years in your compost. So actually by, by steeping them, you can soften um, the, the structure and they're more compostable after cooking uh, and will break down, you know, at a- What is the tea like that is made from the seed? What's the um, flavor? It's, um, they, I mean, they don't call it a tea. They call it an antioxidant rich brew. <laughs> technically not a tea um that's true yeah. it. but it i would say it's All like language language. foods that are derived like this <laughs> yeah it's like i think it's like an iced tea it's a little bit a little bit bitter but not in an off-putting way um it's it has it starts out of really vibrant red so avocado seeds are used for dyes uh -huh. um, but as it as it steeps it turns brown um I, I think it's tasty. Is there any nutritional function? Does it have uh, antioxidant properties? Yeah. Most of the antioxidants in the avocado are in the seed. So very more than I forget. Then I'll, I'll put the website in the chat, but they have this whole break. Are you saying that, that the tea from the seed actually does does pull those antioxidants? So the tea itself would then that be uh, positive from an antioxidant standpoint? Yeah. Good. That's good. Yeah, so um, I'm actually gonna put, I'll put these both in the chat. Um, so it's drinkreveal.com. And I think it's matriarchfoods.com. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's like it's only a matter of time between before Celestial Seasons or somebody comes out with a, you know, an avocado seed 
Yeah, it's um, it's interesting, you know, in terms of the the main, you know, the the way innovation works. So a lot of it is happening in small companies, which is typical, uh, and also typical is that large companies sometimes, you know, acquire those those small um, companies. Yeah, after you do all the all the the legwork, then they swoop in and grab it and figure out how to monetize it. Yeah, so Mike, it's scale it. yeah. tea is super poorly regulated. So it could be a tea sane or a, a brew. They use brew. And then uh, Runner uh, asked if I've not tried it with other teas. Uh -huh. What about coffee cherries? Wouldn't that be considered a sort of a, a type of up upcycling? Mm -hmm. Dry, to, dry yeah. coffee cherry uh, flower and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. And they're um, Upcycled Food Association members, the coffee cherry company. Because that seemed a couple of years ago, that seemed to be sort of the the burgeoning category of uh, you know the new thing was uh, yeah. was cascara and things like that. And uh, has there been any? Have you seen any any traction in that realm? Um, yeah, quite a bit. Also on the chocolate, there's the whole fruit chocolate is, oh. is big now. So that you know, pretty much anywhere you're you're, you're taking part of the you know, every culinary school in the world, we, we talk about full product utilization, right? How is the best way to lower your food cost is to use everything that is coming into that kitchen. Mm -hmm. But with our, and, and I think historically we've done that in food manufacturing, you know, that's, that's why there's hot dogs, right? But, but um, as our supply chain gets more and more specialized and there are plants that do one tiny little component of something, they, they just don't have the kind of flexibility in, in thinking or in, in operations to, to really do that full product utilization. Well, I, it, I feel like, um, you know, you've, you've kind of pulled back the lid a little bit for us on seeing a, a real possibility into the future of uh, uh, you know, this, this particular category of upcycling. I mean, we've talked about upcycling, you know, in other presentations earlier, but more focused on on the, on the spent grain side of things, but to see that as the bigger picture, the bigger scale of what upcycling can be, uh, you know, I think is an important category because food waste and, and feeding people is gonna be a never ending problem for us. So it's gotta be someone who can grab the opportunities and figure out how to monetize them and make them profitable and, and uh, useful, you know, to the world. Agreed. Agreed. So is this going to be an ongoing project for your classes? Like when, when you start a new class in the, in the, in the next semester or whatever, will they be diving into similar kind of innovation, Jonathan? Yeah, we always do a real world project. Um, so we've done a few now with Bimbo. We also worked with a regional bakery in Philly, Amorosos, oh. uh, which I'm sure you know. Famous hoagie bun place. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, we could do an, up, an upcycled hoagie bun, man. Then you 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 could get rich on that. <laughs> so the the project we um we focused on with with Bimbo was on the returns, but there's also waste um from the what they call wet waste, right? The ends of the ends from shaping, or you know, little bits of dough here and there as well. Um, things that may have overproofed or you know, especially with a less automated bakery. So there's, there's lots of opportunity to, uh, to keep more out of the bin. Yeah. Well, well of course we've, we've run over. So uh, why don't we, uh, we could have called this session to a, to an end, but continue it in the, in our after party uh, and uh, Rebecca and Jonathan, what we'll do. So each of us log out of this webinar, and then you should have a, a new link that you received from Gurmit on, how to log back in for the for the Zoom meeting where right. where our VIPs who are waiting for us in the lounge will join us for an informal chat where we can talk more you know just off the cuff and continue to explore this for as long as you're able to stay you know with sounds us. great wonderful thank you so much and again uh, thank you Rebecca Eder Jonathan Deutsch uh, we're looking forward to seeing you know now that now that we're aware of the concept now we want to start. To see, we'll keep. We'll be sensitive to when we start to see products appear that you know maybe they they grew out of some of this seminal work that you guys are doing. And uh, thank you for doing that for, for all of us.
I Thanks for having us. That, um, before we go, I realize I put those links that only went to the panelists. So I'm just retyping. Oh, okay. Okay. So we're gonna uh, in the chat. Is it? It'll be in the chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I just now it's to every everyone. So now in the chat, you should see the. Uh, everybody can see the links to the. Let me move my thing so I can see them. I'll leave that up there. We'll leave that up there as we sort of uh, uh, log out of this one. Um, for everybody else who's watching out there, again, um, join us on Wednesday, gluten-free baking with uh, Richard Coppage. And next week, we'll, again, kind of explore, I think it's, a, it's, it's not quite the same as upcycling, but it's, it kind of is all about the bottom line. And I'll, I'll say this, um, you know, in advance that, um, that Josh Allen at, at uh, Companion, as you'll see in his presentation next week, essentially saved his company by, by putting attention on where they were losing money as opposed to where they were making the money and turned the entire bottom line from red to black. And so that's what we're gonna see next week in his presentation. So I think it's a, it'll be a great way to kind of, uh, and, and then finally on our last week, of course, come back for, uh, we're gonna have just a, a fun conversation uh, with Dave Dahl, the founder of Dave's Killer Breads, which I call sort of the, uh, the, the, what would you call it? The, the story, the bread story of the last decade. Uh, so, sure. so we'll get a chance to hear the, uh, the backstory of that and what he's doing with his life ever since as he's moved on from beyond Dave's Killer Bread into the next chapter in his life. So all that's still to come, uh, but we'll continue this conversation in the after party. So we'll see all of you next time. See Jonathan, Rebecca, and all of you who can join us in the after party in just two or three minutes. Sounds Thanks good. so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our team behind the scenes. Our event, technical and production partners, Ganoid Communications, including our producer, Gurmit Singh, and his team, Jida Gajaria, Gagandeep Singh, and Jaydev Kashari. Thanks also to Ted Nelson and Lael Fretzel of our creative and marketing team at Gumbo Marketing, and the many folks at Johnson & Wales University who supported me throughout this event. My executive assistant, Sarah Standifer, communications director, Melinda Law, Chancellor Mim Rooney, Charlotte Campus President Cheryl Richards, and our executive team leaders, deans and faculty, Maureen Dumas, Michael Schrader, Michelle Nicholas, Mark Norman, Brent Steyerwalt, Laurie Heinbach, Jerry Lanuza, Amy Felder, Harry Paymiller, Richard Miskovich, and many, many others. Thank you all.